Are you always coming up with ideas? Do you marvel at successful business owners? Do you hate being told what to do? Ever take things apart just to see how they work? Are you a dreamer? If you've answered yes to any of these questions, this podcast is for you. Welcome to the Entrepreneurial Enclave with Kevin Wortham. The podcast that focuses on building, maintaining, pivoting, planning, and investing in you, the entrepreneur. But first, a word from our sponsor. Tapes and Specialties is the world leader in tape manufacturing and specialty conversion with over 40 years of experience. In addition to our pro brand of high quality specialty adhesive tapes, we provide contract converting services that help improve your profitability, streamline your supply chain, and reduce inventory cost. We offer the most complete range of converting capabilities in the industry, such as cloth tape, double coated tape, specialty tape, paper tape, masking tape, vinyl tape, carton sealing tape, adhesive transfer tape, duct tape, phone tape, electrical tape, filament tape, foil tape, reflective tape. And the tape just keeps on rolling. Visit us online today at www.protapes.com or call us at 800-345-0234. Pro Tapes, it's just how we roll. Okay. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another fantastic episode of the Entrepreneur Enclave, Life's Coming Attraction. I am your host, Kevin Wortham. So listen, we've got this young lady, a dynamic young lady we're bringing back for the second time. (laughs) Why are you laughing, Sherry? Why? (laughs) You don't think you're dynamic? (laughs) I think I am very dynamic. Okay, let me... And young at heart. All right, let me finish the introduction. (laughs) And... uh, I had her and her husband on the show before, and she did really well uh, as a team. So now we're bringing her back as an individual so she can really speak more jewels into the existence. All right, Sherry, welcome to the platform. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Okay, so let's, let's get started. So the last time you were here, we were talking about relationships. You were talking about how you met Tracy. And now I understand you're back and you're about to drop another book. Tell us about that book you're dropping. Yes. So thank you for having me back. I definitely appreciate it. I'm always honored when people trust me with their platform and their audience. Um, So I just want to make sure I say that. Um, Yes. So it's so interesting how the universe and God directs your steps. And some of the things that we, I talk about in just in relationship is how you can come a better and a different version of yourself. And so my book is called Second Act, Living Boldly and Abundantly at Any Age. And it chronicles my life. It chronicles a shift and changes um, and evolution that I had to make to live this current life that I'm living, which is very, very different than I think I ever envisioned. So first, you know, I think you know this, I'm from the Bay Area, from California. Um, I started out in telecom and um, and like uh, applications because I lived in Silicon Valley or in near Silicon Valley. And now I live on the East Coast and and I was single, a single parent. And now I live on the East Coast. I'm married. I'm in a medical device industry. Um, And Tracy and I are really, really um, living an abundant life one that I lived prior to him, but it's it's elevated um, even more since we've been married. And so I've been asked before to write a book because people have told me my story is inspirational. I've raised two children who both um, were Division One athletes and things like that. And I said, you know, I don't know that that's a story. I've survived breast cancer, but so many people I know have been cancer survivors. Yes. And so I just always felt like... I didn't think that there was anything exceptional. But what I will say about this second act, this second life that I'm living, I am married to an author who um, is an entrepreneur who completely encouraged me to tell my story. And once we got married, it seemed like the story became full circle. So it wasn't so much that I didn't have um, a testimony prior to us getting married. But there definitely was something about um, me finding love and attracting love at a more mature age in my life. Most people know I was 51 when Tracy and I married. And for professional black women, a lot of times society, the media has told us that we don't have many options by then. And then (laughs) and then the things that together we've both been able to accomplish and um, experience. 
So everything from us talking to you on your platform yes. to us being on national television and in national magazines, um, talking about our love and our life. And it's created um, a platform where I help other women um, in so many areas, not only in the areas of um, coaching them on um, how to um, evolve so they can attract the life that they want to live. Yes. But now I'm even working with some local organizations in the city of Trenton with women who have been impacted by violence um, in the communities and then helping them understand their self-worth, their self-love and how they can turn that trauma into triumph. So I'm really feel like I'm coming full circle. And I used to always tell Tracy, I don't know if I said it on the first time we interviewed on the podcast that when I met him, I was inspired that he lives his purpose. And you know, Tracy, I mean, he oh, yes. really lives his purpose. Absolutely. And I was, and I, and I was envious of that, not in a bad way, but in a good way to be like, I need to find my purpose the way he lives his. Yes. And I believe now that we've become a union, um, that I am definitely evolving into my purpose. And I'm really excited about that. So that's what Second Act is all about. Now, I've got a lot of questions, but I'm going to start with the most important question. Okay. Commu communication. How, yes. do, how do you communicate within yourself that you're worthy for love? That's the first question. And then I, I guess okay. part two of that is how do you communicate outwardly that you're ready and worthy of love? Yeah, no, those are great questions. And they're ones that I help women every day that I'm coaching them resolve. Yes. So the first thing is just understanding who you are. I tell everyone when we were created and we were born, we were perfect yes. in the sense that we had no fears. Um, we didn't have any doubts or concerns. When you think about babies, when they're learning how to walk, that's something they've never done, but they attack it, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and they, and, and they tell you, Exactly. They tell you babies, they, you know, they, they know if people are good or not good. They know energy yes. and they trust their intuition. So they cry if there was somebody they don't want to be around. Yes. We continue to grow and evolve and we're impacted by um, our parents are divorced or we're in a single parent household or someone cheated on us or whatever. So we kind of lose that connection to our inner self and yes. the external things start impacting us more negatively. So first, the first step is just getting back in touch with your inner self, getting back connected, yes. because we all have strong intuition. We all have strong discernment. But in some ways, we, we throw that away and we no longer trust that because these external things have impacted us. So that's the first thing. So just being in touch with yourself. The second part is just knowing that we are brought here on this earth. To live a bountiful, abundant life. Yes. You know, no matter what you believe, no one was created to live mis in, a, in a way of misery. No one was created, you know, to have hardship. Yes. So we have to recognize and understand that that's our birthright. Living in an abundant way is our birthright. Yes. And we are worthy of that. And then, you know, the things that we tell ourselves, again, that ex external influence, you know, that our lips are big or our booties are big or... Our, our hair is nappy and things like that. We have to understand the beauty in all of yes. all of how we're created. Yes. And once we have those things and we understand our value system, what's really important to us? People can call them deal breakers. They can call them, you know, you know, these are things that I won't tolerate. But what's your value system? And how do you attract people that appreciate your value system yes. um, in relationship with friends, in your relationships at work and in the companies that you choose to work for and in the real relationships for, with romantic? romantic partners. All yes. those things are really, really important in kind of finding who you are. So now you know who you are. Now you communicate that to someone else. I give Tracy, I give the example of Tracy and I dating. And when we first started dating, Tracy's busy, as you know, he didn't call me as often as I'm used to being called because, yes, yes. you know, men pursue you. Yes. Well, you know, I didn't recognize and know his schedule. So I wasn't sure of his level of interest in me. Yes. And so I just shared with him. He said how interested he was in me. And I said, well, sometimes it's difficult for me to tell because, you know, I'm an only child yes. and I've been doted on. I was, you know, one of my grandparents' first grandchildren. So I've been the center of attention. And so what love tends to look like to me from people that really, truly love me is they check on me often and they check on me frequently. Yes. And so if you continue to tell me that you're interested in me and that, you know, you like me a lot, but you don't check on me, that in my mind it doesn't all quite, quite you know, yeah, yeah. Com um, commute, you know, compute rather. Yeah, yeah. And so, and I said, um, 
And so if you tell me, if you tell me you like me, I need you to check on me more often. Yeah. And he's like, Oh my goodness. Okay. Is that all you needed? He's like, I didn't want you to think I was stalking you. I was like, well, like I said, I'm an only, I'm an, I'm an only child. So stalking is good. I'll yeah. tell you when it's too much. Yeah. And, and he laughed and I said, is that something that you can do? So that's a way of me knowing who I am. Yes. I mean, communicating to the person who's showing some interest in me what I need and why, yes. and then me asking him if he can can do that for me. Yes. And he could. And so now it's for me to sit back and observe if he can. I've shared with you what I need. Mm -hmm. You said you can deliver. Mm -hmm. And now I need to sit back and see if you are delivering. Yeah. If you do, we continue on as, well, as we did. No. If you don't, then you may not be able to live up to my expectations, so I probably need to... Um, look at someone else who can. No, so no, we far too often, we as people, women, probably more than men, mm -hmm. but we as people tell people what we need, they don't meet our expectations. And then we continue to force them to try to meet our expectations. And when we understand and know and love ourselves, we know that just like we attracted that person, we can attract someone else who will align with our expectations. We well, do me, not have to force that. Yeah, let me let me ask this question. Because you, so... When you when you talk about telling a person what you need, what's the what's the time frame for that person to get it right? I mean, it, you like if you're telling a person what you need, and they hear you, but they're not they're not quite listening. Does that become a deal breaker in the larger scheme of things? Well, yeah, because I want someone who who can who. Well, the first thing is I need to be communicating in a way that connects with a man's heart yes. or a person's heart, yes. not with their head and with the analytical piece, because the analytical piece is hearing to respond or defend or, um, you know, uh, analyze. And that's not the part that I want to be connecting with. Yes. So that's why I'm really, really clear on not blaming, not being off putting. And not saying, you know, you didn't call me. I need you to call me. I am needing to share with them. I want to have heart conversations. So I want to hit them to hear me. Yes. And so that's where I start. Um, if they don't, and I observe, you know, I give them a one or two times. And I may even remind them, oh, remember when I said that, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. Then, um, and I don't see that a change in that behavior, then I'm okay with that. And and it, and it's clear. It's like, hey, you know, I've shared with you some of the things that I need, and it just looks like you may not be in a position to provide those things at this time, and that's okay. But I'm going to go ahead and look for someone, or you know, put myself back out there so that I can attract someone who does align. Yeah, understood. But you have to have confidence in yourself that you will find that next person. A lot of times we date in desperation. Yep. And so when we do that, we think this person is the last person on earth. Mm -hmm. So they won't, you know, so we aren't confident enough to um, feel that we're going to be able to attract the next person. Got you. Now, now communicating, talking about how do you communicate vulnerabilities and how do you communicate traumas uh, to your partner? Uh, if you've gone through any, how do you communicate that? Yeah, so vulnerability is one thing. Vulnerability is a sensitivity that just allows someone to see you um, without, you know, walls up and things yes. like that. Trauma is a different thing. So, you know, I've had traumatic experiences in relationships. Yes. Um, and so I, Tracy and I have had those conversations. Ooh, when you did that, this it, it, it reminded me of this experience that I had in a relationship. And so I know that some of my response had to do with that. I'm still working on that. I'm still evolving. Yes. But I share that with my partner to let them know that that was an experience that triggered me. Yes. Love it. Now, being vulnerable, on the other hand, is being confident enough to share yes. that. So what tends to happen is that you're triggered by a traumatic experience, but you're not vulnerable enough to share that. Now, say, now, slow down and say that one more time. Yep. So you can be triggered by a traumatic experience. Yes. But the vulnerability comes in trusting your partner to have the conversation about why you were triggered. Got you. And protecting you as you're sharing. Yeah, because gotcha. you want to... You want to show up as your full self. Yes. And your full self is not just the excitement and the laughs and the smiles. Your full self is also some of the fears and insecurities yes. that you may have. Yes. Love it. Thank you. Thank you. And you're welcome. Now, when women are coming to you, how long mm -hmm. does it take women to feel comfortable with you in terms of digging or delving deeper into themselves? How long does that take? Is this an hour? Yeah, you know, that's a great question as well. Mm -hmm. So what, so a couple things. I think we have enough 
content out in the universe where they usually by the time they um, have decided to do, um, I do an intake call. Yes. Usually by the time they've exci- decided to explore my coaching program, they've seen Tracy and I, and most of the time they feel very comfortable with me. It's almost as if they feel like they know me. Yes. And I think one of the things about tr- that um, differentiate Tracy and I to most people in this space is one, we are really honest and pretty vulnerable. I mean, we definitely have some, um, the boundaries that we've agreed to that we try not to cross, but we're pretty, pretty vulnerable and I think relatable. So I think that makes people feel comfortable. Then we do our intake process where they fill out a questionnaire prior to them even talking to me. So they've, I have a good sense of who they are. So when we're talking, I'm clear on what their needs are and I can have a conversation with that in mind. The other piece is I think, I mean, I really um, am an advocate of leaning into our feminine energy as women. That's really where our power center is, is, yes. is just like men's masculine space. When when a man is really masculine, he's just that much more handsome and, yes. and you know, because he's confident and he's a protector. And so um, I really lean into that feminine space when I'm talking to other women because there's a quiet confidence in that, that I have and that they're attracted to. And so usually we have a very um, good relationship from the beginning, but I'd say my, my program is three months. And I'd say somewhere in week four or five is where I get, they usually tend to start feeling vulnerable enough where I may get tears or I may have some breakthroughs or they start really talking about some family issues that um, may be buried or hidden or that they hadn't been comfortable to talk about. And I create a, um, a space for them. And so that's why it's so important when you're looking for someone to give you guidance in any space where you're doing any self-healing, any self-realization, that it's more about how you feel with that person yes. because you know, whether someone has a PhD in therapy or whatever, that that's important and that's helpful. But if you don't feel comfortable with them, if they're only managing you from a clinical perspective, you know, you may or may not ever have the um, type of breakthroughs and the type of progress that you need versus someone who's had some very similar experiences, has done some research in clinical work, but they relate to you on a personal level you know, on an emotional level. And that's, in my opinion, the most important thing about finding a good coach. Now I'm going to, I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask an ignorant question. (laughs) No question is ignorant. So I'm, I'm hearing you. I'm understanding everything that you say. Is there, is there a, uh, a social, not a social, but is there some type of societal, societal construct in which we must fit in to understand this process that you're taking us through. I guess what I'm saying is, do you have to be of a certain ilk to understand this? Because I mean, I'm, I'm thinking the average woman who, you know, let me, let me just say it. Yeah. The average woman. <laughs> make who, it plain. Yeah. Make it plain. Yeah, the average woman who may or may not completed high school is going to struggle with this conversation and may or may not get that right. How, how do you, how do you make it? How do you make it simplistic that even that person can understand that? Yeah, so that's a great question. And, you know, um, every person isn't for everyone. I tend to attract women that are similar in age and um, uh, similar, somewhat similar in background. Okay. However, I think my story resonates and relates to everyone. In my book, Second Act, I go from me being a toddler um, growing up on an Indian reservation with grandparents and my mother at college. So now I, so I was the product of a high school, a person that got married, you know, pregnant in high school yes. and I had to live with my grandparents like a lot of us do, yes. you know, so there's some relation there. Okay. And then each step along the way. So I was that person at some point in my journey. And that's why I share that. I didn't have to stay there yes. at that level. Um, But I was able to learn from that season and grow and it impacted me moving forward. So I think most women, we all want to be loved, honored, cherished by men for the most part, because that's kind of how we're created. We're created for partnership in some, you know, in some way. And, um, you know, when 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 people are having conversations and and they're rolling their necks or whatever they're doing, I'm like, you know, and so what man wants and which man wants to, you know, deal with that, you know, and I and, and, and I. I can really, and, and they can relate at every level. Yeah. You know, I'm going to miss you right now. I, you know, mm-hmm. yeah. 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 No, I, I, I feel bad. For, I feel bad for them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to deal 
deal with you. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, I definitely shift my messaging um, and can be a, a different, relate in a different way. Okay. But I think my coaching program, the price point, the commitment, the things like that, um, I definitely think there's a target audience that I have. And for the most part of all the women that I've coached, they've been similar in that. Yes. Because, you know, a, a lot of times I see women, you know, older women, maybe, you know, 30, 40, that are still coming from a marginalized community that still experience the trauma that you're talking about. But for some reason, they just can't articulate that and they stay in this pattern of repeating themselves. How do we make that connection for them to let them know that, you know, we can change your life or you can change their lives as well, right? So I think where where that comes in, and I work with so a, a group in in Trenton, of, yes. like I said, of, of mothers who have lost their children to gun violence, yes. and they have and want the same thing I want. Yes, they have the very similar desires that I have. Yes, and and so when I walk in that room with those women, I am them. We do, we walk through breathing exercises so we can all be centered and we can all have conversations. I remind them of how beautiful they are. I remind them of what their purpose is now that they've lost a loved one. How do they honor that loved one? And so I completely relate to them. And I think that's where the bridge is. The gap is filled. I'm, I, you know, I may have this education or have this occupation or whatever, but at the end of the day, I'm a black woman in a community that I'm still discriminated against yes. very similarly to the way that they are. Yes. And I have had and suffered loss, maybe not directly, but indirectly. So I'm just as concerned for my nephews that they are for their sons. I have young men that I've tutored and mentored who have been killed in Oakland and gun violence. So again, I may not have had the exact same experience, but I can definitely relate. And just like when, when they say with children, you get down to their level and they, you know, you you don't look so overpowering. Yes. I'm at their mercy. I'm at their level and I'm in their space. And so I'm the one that has to acquiesce to, you know, read the room and know how I need to navigate. And I think that's what makes, you know, the way I approach this whole process of growth. um, That's what makes me relatable. Now, Thank you for sharing that part. Now, so so mm-hmm. since you started working on the second book, right, do you think that there's going to be a follow-up book? There's there's going to be a third book because you're going to identify some of the things that you wanted to touch, but you just weren't able to touch? So, th- so this is my first book. You know, oh. Tracy's writing his second book. Oh, so this okay. is my first book. Gotcha. Well, Tracy's writing. Yes. yes. Thank you. Tracy's writing his second book yes. that's going to be from the time he ended from the block to the boardroom till now. And we are definitely already being asked about a book that we'd write together. Yes. So there is a possibility that after Tracy's second book comes out, that we will look at something together Um, because, you know, now, um, in fact, I posted something today about, you know, if you're not growing, you're dying. And someone, we've been asked to be on two panels to talk about love and legacy or love and and economics. And so it's one thing to say, yes, I've attracted my husband and these are the things that I've done. But then I'm a wife and I've been a wife now going on, you know, close to two years now. So that conversation needs to elevate. Yes. How do Tracy and I navigate together? How do I support him as an entrepreneur? How does he support me as a busy executive? And then how do we do the things that we're doing together, whether it's on the relationship platform, my coaching platform, or the business we just invested in? Yes. You know, so um, so we just, I, I would, I, we continue to grow and evolve. Our story continues to grow and evolve. And we're inspiring everyone from the single person to a friend of mine who's been married 30, 20 years 25 years and she just inboxed me and said her and her husband went through a tough patch and just the positive way in which Tracy and I engaged with her gave both of them inspiration to kind of work their thing out. So, yeah, so we're just continuing to lean into what I believe is our purpose together and continue to evolve what that looks like. So, you know, I'm not just talking about, oh, how to date. Yes. You know, I'm talking about how to how, what my experience has, has been being a very supportive and currently successful mate yes. and how we do that. Yes. Now, on the on the on the woman side, on the black woman side. Right. Yes. Are there are there challenges within that 
that whole space where black women don't know how to work with one another and, and, and how do we get around that, right? I guess that, yeah. that, that whole self-hatred or, or love or lack thereof for one another. Right. So, you know, a couple things. One is I have amazing, amazing, amazing um, friendship circles. And I talk about them on my book because that narrative around black women not getting along, that narrative around us, you know, being crabs in a barrel, I personally don't experience that. And I want to show a different side. Yes. Um, that being said, this country was built on us being divided period. It was built on us being divided. So there's no, there's no wonder that we have issues in our community around trusting each other and working together and things like that. And so, um, you know, I'm constantly, especially, you know, when we're talking about um, working in cities where there's a lot of trauma, you know, and people um, communicating with each other in a way that doesn't honor each other as, as the, the beautiful black women that we are. So, you know, that's part of, we're going to do a retreat. That's part of the retreat. How are we communicating with each other? How are we honoring each other? You know, we can't, we can't be cussing each other out and calling each other out our names. That's not productive. That's not. And, and how do you expect for a man to honor and respect you if you're not honoring and respecting sisters that look like you? So that, you know, and we do so much more together Yes. Then we can separately. And we continue to prove that every in, in all our historic references to whether it's Black Wall Street and all the cities where there were black millionaires, there was just a lot of community and working together. Yes. And so, you know, those are the, the, the examples and the reflections we want to have. And then we use current the skills. Um, the communication skills and things like that to speak to how we actually um, put that in, in motion with yes. each other. Yes. Now, and I, I think I might have asked that que- this question, but I would ask it again. How long is the healing process if, you're, if you've gone through trauma? How long should that be? Ooh, that's a loaded question. So, and I'm not, I'm not a licensed therapist or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. What I can say is it probably depends on the level of traumatic experiences that you've had. So yes. I know Tracy talks a lot about ACEs, advanced childhood ex- experiences, and he had a score of like seven or eight. He had dealt with so many things. Other people, you know, so it may have taken him longer, you know, to come out of some of that. Some of that also is self, it, it is, is your own desire. Gotcha. Um, it, it, you know, I look at Tracy's story in some ways and say it almost as if he decided to go cold turkey. Okay, I'm gonna do this life right. <laughs> you know, yes, yes. I mean, and he had some some blips in the road, but you know, after 17 years of living a certain way, it, it's like he flipped a switch and yes. and decided to evolve and grow. And I think we all are capable of doing that. I think the reality though is that it takes time. It takes time for you to even recognize what what and how trauma has impacted you you know we live in a city that's been heavily impacted by trauma and it functions dysfunctionally and people think that that's That's normal yeah yeah (laughs) and it's not you know me coming you know me coming from two other cities i'm like no you know we don't do it like that you know we don't do you know you know that's not the way (laughs) other cities do it and so some of that is just recognizing exposing yourself to something different so that you even know the way in which you're engaging is a traumatic response to something. And so it, so from that perspective, it can take, you know, I've been on my healing journey and I I wouldn't consider that I lived a really traumatic, had a lot of traumatic experiences, but I've been on my healing journey just to become a better person. I started in 2015, you know, just consistent meditation, consistent affirming who I am, consistently wanting to be a better person and how I engage with others, wanting to be a bridge builder, a collaborator, and not someone who is divisive and off-putting, wanting to not defend, but hear. I want to hear what and how I'm impacting you so that I can be better or I can decide, you know what? I'm not going to, it's not worth me making that shift or that yes. change. I'm comfortable and satisfied with who I am and where I am. Yes. So that can take some time and the, probably the deeper the traumatic wound, the longer it can take to heal. I love it. Great, great, great answer. And then you started to say something, but I want to dig in that deeper uh, as, as well. As you're going through this whole connection, right, how important it is to, to discuss with your women and with your potential mate your your faithfulness or your religious uh, beliefs how, how important is it to talk about that or have communication oh, at that level that is so important so i will say this 
Um, I think I've told this story too, so I don't think Teresa will mind. Um, one of the things that he asked me before we went exclusive, we were dating, but yes. before we actually went exclusive or it was just me and him, um, the one question he asked me was about my faith. Yes. He said that his faith was very important to him. And he had dated a person prior to me who did not have that same faith. They had had a traumatic experience related to organized religion and as such had a very sarcastic and very um, kind of negative um, way or relationship with religion. Yeah. And um, as a result, it, it was it, there was strains. You know, he's like, I'm at church praising God and they're kind of act, acting aloof or not interested or not engaged. Yeah, yeah. And he was really... Um, adamant about sharing, like when he was in solitary confinement, how he read the Bible and how he spoke to God and how, you know, he promised himself he would never be back. Yes. Um, he, he vowed to God. And so his faith in God is so important. And he yes. wanted to know what my views were. And I was able to share with him that I'd grown up in a very strict religious household. And because of that, I did have my issues and challenges with organized religion. However, I had a very strong relationship with God. I have a very strong spiritual connection. And I had just so happened to be listening to a sermon about the fruitages of spirit and how it applies to relationships. And I shared that with him. And so I said, I don't necessarily go to church every Sunday. At that time, I did not. Yes. I said, I don't necessarily I said, I don't necessarily go to church every Sunday, but my faith in God is strong. I've read the Bible through forward and backwards three times. I know it well. Yes. And I could, I attribute my loyalty, my integrity, the, the good parts of who I am to having that very strong foundation growing up, even though I don't agree with every single thing, but I know that th growing up in that structured environment really gave me a good foundation for what I believe are the better parts of who I am. Yes. And so based on that, we obviously moved forward. And what it was so interesting was the first time that a man had had a conversation with me about religion or about faith. I think we just make assumptions and we don't have those deep conversations because we're potentially afraid of the answer or we don't know how important it is to the success of relationship. But yes. that's very important. Yes. Thank you for sharing that, right? You know, because oftentimes women, um, some, sometimes in a lot of relationships, women are attending church more than, than, their, than their partner, their mate. And that, yep. that becomes a challenge too because some, some men, they think that uh, religion uh, is so organized and so disrespectful that they won't even go inside of a church. And I've got a lot of friends like that. Right. Right. Well, yeah, yeah so. so definitely want to be on a similar page. Yes. Or you just need to understand, um, as far as your value system, how, you know, how tolerable, how tolerant you are of someone who believes differently. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, this is good. Anything else we need to know about this, this, this book or about you and how you do your various workshops? Yeah, so the book is coming out on February 21st. Yes. Please go to our website. Either you can go to our normal website, www.justthefacts.com, and get on our mailing list, or you can go directly to the book website, which is at www.secondactsbook.com. Dot com. Um, it comes out on the 21st. I'm really, really excited. We've obviously been promoting it for a while, so I'm hoping that it hits the number one status <laughs> somewhere. I but so more too, than yes. more, more importantly, I've, I've been getting such really positive feedback about how inspirational it was, how, you know, people have had shame around issues, around um, abuse, physical abuse and things like that, and yes. how I, I've helped them cope with some of that. It's gone to some book clubs and some um, book bloggers, and so that is just so important to me, you know, and not everyone can afford my coaching program. Not everyone um, can be invested in their um, evolution and their growth, but most people can spend twenty one ninety five for a book, yeah, you know, yeah. to, <laughs> to benefit yes. them on their journey and to get started. Exactly. Yes. So yes. that was like my love letter to black women specifically okay. um, to say, you are worthy, you are beautiful and do not let those, um, decisions that, you know, maybe weren't the best at the time or the most inf informant or weren't our finest moments. Don't let those moments um, dictate or define who you are. Yes. You still have the ability to do it better and do it differently and, and lean into your second act as well. Yes. I feel like I'm a star of my show. 
and you know, I shine bright and I want us all to do that. Uh, Cause I always say we heal the black woman, we heal our communities and then we can heal the world. We are the seed of um, civilization. And I just think we're the most beautiful and important thing. And I just continue to um, use my platform to make sure that we know that, that black women know they are amazing, loved and worthy. Absolutely. Now, I, two more questions. Mm-hmm. By you getting to this point, were there any challenges that you personally had to overcome to getting to this point where you're an author and you're just unpacking your trauma and you're just unpacking all this whole process? Were, were there any challenges to that part? You know, no. Yes and no. So for the most part, like I said, I didn't live a really, really like, you know, me and Tracy's lives are very, very different. Um so, I, you know, I, I can't say that I had those traumas like he did. I definitely had experiences, as we all do. Um, what was probably the most challenging was just self-realization and accountability of the bad decisions I'd made and why, yes. and kind of unpacking some of that stuff. And um, me being an accountable and the failure of different things, whether they were friendships, relationships, professional um, experiences and things like that, because sometimes just sitting with you and realizing like, Ooh, I, I have been a jerk or, Ooh, I do get defensive or, Ooh, I don't listen to people or, Ooh, I do want to have a last word or, Ooh, I am trying to prove that I'm smart or, you know, sometimes just dealing with your own stuff and, and yeah. you, you dealing with you yeah, yeah. can be challenging <laughs> because you realize that you have made, so you have been a jacked up person sometimes yes. and people not liking you or whatever those things are, they're valid because you've been a, you've been a piece of work. Yes. And so some of it was just, just having those realizations. So that was one thing. Yeah. And then, I mean, I love my mother and, and I don't know, I, think you know this my mother died the week before Tracy and I got married so reliving reliving some of that and just recalling the hurdle of resentment that I had to get over for my mother and I to have a really really um fruitful and productive and healthy relationship because I just resented my mother for raising me in such a strict environment and I remember my first coach said but shoot you are amazing so uh I think your mother did a pretty good job and she was absolutely right and I had to get over all that stuff yes. you were too strict and you were too this and I wanted to go and hang out with people and you didn't let me you know just all those things that I felt I missed out on but when I look at my life today yes. she prepared me for it wow any any so I, we just talked about the challenges any regrets none Got gotcha. you. every single experience brought me to this day here gotcha. and Tracy and I together is probably one of the most amazing experiences in my life. Got you. I, I, I love the partnership that you and Tracy have. And I'm so Thank glad you. that you are able to share that because, man, black love is powerful, but we don't often hear that, right? Right. Yeah, and so I'm glad that you guys are finding that space where you can tell your story and encourage other folks to dig deep and to share their story as well, or to, or to jump on the bandwagon and say, let's share this story with this, this story with one another. Cause we need to yes. hear more of this black love. I, I love it. I love Absolutely. It. You know, cause, Absolutely. Cause I'm, I'm going to mess this up with my math. I think my, you know, my father passed away about five years ago. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think him and my mother have been married for 60 years. Oh, wow. And I'm, yeah. And I'm saying in that process, I know somebody was a goofball, but they, <laughs> you know, but somebody did what they had to do yep. to hold on. And unfortunately, that generation, n- nobody had Facebook. Nobody was articulating. Yep. Nobody had the woman's yep. group to, to, nobody to talked talk about, about things. the trauma or the healing process. But yep. uh, to me, and, and, and the reason why I seek out love is because I've got a good example. I'm like, if my parents can make, yes. if my parents can do 60 years, then I think I can do at least 60 days, right? <laughs> if right, I, right. If I no, up. exactly, <laughs> exactly. No, you're absolutely right. I agree. I saw great. My grandparents were married like that too, and yeah. I just saw an amazing example of a beautiful relationship. And yeah. I've always aspired to have that. I think there were times in my journey that I tried to convince myself that I didn't want that because I think sometimes we either believe we won't get it or we're not worthy of it or it may fail. And so we don't want to 
yes. put it out there. But I finally was like, you know what? If I want it, I have to speak it into existence. Exactly. And then once I do that, and then I'll, my steps will be directed to accomplish that. So, yes. so yeah, I, yeah. I agree. I had a good example, too. I was yeah. fortunate. And, you know, and, and my father, who was not a, uh, he, was, he was a great communicator on certain levels, but not the best on other levels. But, mm-hmm. he, but he would say, listen, decide what is the most important thing about your mate and about this relationship, and you do whatever it takes to make it work. Yeah. Agreed. And, and they and they did, you know. And, they did. And, they yeah. did. and so, you know, when I get into, you know, trials and tribulations regarding relationship, you know, I, I often, you know, think back to what my father said, you know, the relationship, you know, after sixty years, you know, every day is not going to be a rose garden. But correct. But you always have to like your partner. And if you always like your partner, you will get through that day so that in the evening you can have discussion. Yeah, you know, and, I, and a couple things. One is you talked about your dad not having having good communication skills in some ways, but not others. And that's why I'm also appreciative that Tracy um, participates in a lot of my conversations around relationship because yes. I don't think historically he's been a great communicator, but I love that he's starting to be example to other black men to yes. start opening up and communicating. And I, I love that. And I think it's powerful. The right. second piece is you're right. People talk about the love of relationship, but the like is the more important part. Yeah, Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> because we know we always, you know, we always love people, yeah, yeah. but I don't necessarily like them. Exactly. But, <laughs> but in relationship, in marriage especially, you know, we got to continue to like each other yes. because that's what, that's the glue, the liking. Yes, <laughs> I yes. mean, you know, when I think about, I mean, we, you know, we lived in boxes while that house was being built. And of yes. course, you know, we, it was supposed to be nine months and it was 18 months and, 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 and so on and so forth. And the thing that got us through that is that we still liked each other, even yes. though we were in an apartment in boxes, you know, yes. wedding gifts and storage, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the, the timeline being stretched out and missed and supply chain issues and frustration and yeah. all that. But we, uh, we continued to like each other through the process. Awesome. Awesome. Sherry, this is the final jump yeah. roll question. Three years from now, what can we expect from you on the on the motivational tour, the author tour? What can we expect from you three years from now? Wow, that's a great question. So we in three years, we have a plan of potentially a business that we've just invested in. We yes. will reevaluate where that's at and look and see if we are going to be positioning ourselves to live in Ghana or Senegal or somewhere where we are not the minority. So that's the one thing. Awesome. Um, I'm, you know, the goal is for us to continue to share our platform, to yes. speak with others. So in three years, obviously, we would expect that we're elevating and we're growing in that and we're public speaking across the country, yes. encouraging Black love, Black life, and what, you know, Black economics and legacy looks like yes. because we are definitely wanting to live, to leave a love legacy as well as, you know, wealth, um, passed down. And to that point, we need to be teaching people how to be good financial stewards as well. Gotcha. Our children, gotcha. our community and understanding like my daughter, my, I, have a, I have a little glam baby. And, and every time they show me, they bought her some Nikes. I said, you better have bought her a Nike stock, yeah, yeah. A, a share of stock. Exactly. And so, you know, just trying to shift us from being pure consumers yes. to consuming, but also building wealth at the same time. Now I, I've got I've got an idea for you, right? I am enjoying this conversation so much. What would it look like if you were to do a small play? A small play, like a play at the theater? <laughs> yeah, a, the, a theatrical work, right? Where the, where this conversation is is taking place in front of other people. I love that. I don't know. Well, let's talk about. Let's see what that looks like. I, I've got no acting skills whatsoever, but I just I just thought that because man, that would be another level of engagement, right? It would be. So yeah, let's see what that looks right. like. Let me get the book out, yeah, and yeah. then we can talk for sure. <laughs> yeah, just, listen, Sherry, this has been fantastic. I don't. I can go on and on and on. But have you shared with us everything that we need to know about this book coming out and the work that you continue to do in the community for women and for people to build fruitful and productive relationships? Have you said everything that you needed to say? Yeah, I think so. Like I said, we're pretty easy to find. Yes. So, you know, uh, just the facts, J 
Just Facts on Instagram. My program is called Activate Your Amazing, but I definitely do an intake process because I pour a lot into women, so I don't take everybody. Yes, yes. So, you know, get on our newsletter, see if our messaging resonates with you. Um, the book is called Second Act. You can get it on Barnes & Noble, um, Amazon, um, Books A Million. Um, Tracy and I will actually be, since it's the local, we'll be at the venue by P on the 19th of uh, February. I don't know when this is going to air, okay. but it's a brunch, love and legacy brunch. And we will be on the panel talking about love and legacy. I know a lot of people reach out to Tracy for consultation and that'll be a place where you can come and support another uh, black entrepreneur. She's putting it on and, and hearing um, um, how we navigate business and entrepreneurship and things like that. So we are definitely out in the community and, and very easy to find. Now, listen, I'm going to tell you something. I want to thank you for this, this, this free consultation because now I'm going to be a better listener. <laughs> I appreciate it. No problem at all. I love, I love sharing and anyone who can benefit from my words, yes. I'm always honored yes. by. She, the platform is always open to you. You're always welcome. Nothing but success as you and Tracy move the mountain forward, right? And so, Aw, thank you so much. I so, appreciate so it, and thank you for having me. I'm going to ask you, once we close out, I'm going to ask you to uh, email me your bio and your headshot, and then any, any connective uh, aspects that you want us to know about how folks can connect with you and keep in touch with you and follow you. Okay, I'll do bio, headshot, and then all my links. Yep, all your links. All right. Okay, I'll send that to you. If not tonight, we're still at the restaurant first thing in the morning. That'll be perfect. Sherry, thank you so much. You have been fantastic. Nothing but success and continued blessings upon you and, and yours. I so appreciate you. Right. Thank you. Have a good evening. Right. You as well. We'll talk to you then. Thank uh -huh. you. Bye-bye. Bye. That concludes another episode of The Entrepreneurial Enclave with Kevin Wortham the podcast that focuses on building, maintaining, pivoting, planning, and investing in you, the entrepreneur. We hope you found this episode informative and enlightening. If you have any questions or comments about any of our episodes, please call 609-731-9386. Or email Kevin at minding our business.com. We look forward to joining us for our next one. Until next time.